And we're very blessed and always honored to have them here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite Brother Welch to come, and he's going to introduce our other guests today. Well, praise the Lord. Good morning, Summit Worship Center. I'm filled with joy to be able to introduce the guest that you have this morning, Dr. Larry Martin. Uh, just a little information about Dr. Martin. Larry came to our church when I was just a boy. Of course, I think he was probably just a boy too, an 18, 19-year-old boy. And my dad uh, had invited Larry and his team they were attending Southwestern Assemblies of God Bible College to come to our church and hold a revival. I was just about uh, 12 years old, and they came, and the meetings were wonderful. People from all across the county drove and filled our little church. We, it was called Little Bethel, and it was there in those meetings that I was first introduced to his ministry. He preached the miracles of Jesus, and he preached with such an anointing, and God showed up. I was drawn by his anointing. I was captivated by the anointing of God that was in his life. His life would go. Uh, Dr. Martin would travel the United States and travel the world. He's ministered as a pastor, an evangelist, a missionary, a Bible school teacher. Uh, he specializes in the area of church history and Pentecost history, especially uh, recent Pentecost history. And I was exposed to him once again about four years ago or so at General Presbytery. And I thought, you know, at that particular moment, I felt like the Lord was stirring into my heart that I somehow needed to reconnect with, with Dr. Martin. And who would have thought 35, 40 years later, uh, we would end up here in Alaska together, not having intersect paths over the years, not having really talked or kept in touch but occasionally, my name may come up and his name come up. And for me, fond memories always return to those familiar days being a teenage boy. And he came back to our church uh, several times and ministered to our people. He's here this week to speak in our Holy Spirit conference. He speaks tonight. And then he'll be scheduled uh, throughout the week through Wednesday evening. We're really happy to have him in Alaska could you do me a favor this morning and rise and let's give Dr. Martin an Alaska welcome. Thank you, brother. Good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here today. In January of 1947, two lady evangelists, old-time Pentecostal ladies with Pentecostal buns on their head, came to Comanche, Oklahoma and held a six-week revival in the middle of the winter. And my mom and my dad found Christ in that revival. In fact, my whole clan found Christ in that revival. And Pastor Bill's mother found the Lord in that revival. So we've got a lot of spiritual DNA that uh, joins us together. It is so good to be here. It's good to be with Pastor Bill and his lovely wife and to be in this church. I mean, just the name, Wasilla. Wasilla, I, I like that, you know. <laughs> Fairbanks, eh. <laughs> Anchorage, you know. Wasilla, I mean, this... This is the place to be, you know what I'm saying? I know you're looking me over because you've never seen me before. I'm looking you over because I've never seen you before. You know, sometimes it's good when people don't know you. Kid was taking a college course in uh, calculus and he wasn't good at it. In fact, he wasn't even good at arithmetic, but he had to have this course in calculus and he's... He's sweating bullets. He's like, like a C minus, and he don't know if he's going to pull it out or not. And he thinks if I can just do good on the final, I'll be all right. And if they'll give me enough time, I can work those problems out. And the professor says, "Well, it's going to be a timed test." And he knows he's sunk. He just can't. He can't do it. It's a big old class. They meet for the test, and and the professor starts calling out the time. You've got an hour left. Thirty minutes left. You know, raising the students' anxiety and 
15 minutes left, five minutes left. This kid's only got half the test done. He's got five minutes left. And the professor said, okay, time's up. Bring your test. And students come to the front, and they're, they're bringing their papers in, and they bring a big old stack of papers, you know, like this, turning them in. And that one boy, he didn't even look up. He's working. He's got to pass. He's sweating bullets, you know, and he's got to pass. And the professor says, excuse me, time's up. And he just keeps working. <clears throat> time's up. You don't even acknowledge the professor's in the room. And five minutes passes. Ten minutes. The professor's pacing in the room. He's just so angry. Thirty minutes passes. The kid's still working on the test. After an hour, professor's at his desk sitting, watching him. After an hour, he stands up. Starts coming to the front, and the professor says, where do you think you're going? And he said, well, I'm going to turn my paper in. I, I really need to pass this test. And the professor said, pass this test? Said, you flunked this test an hour ago. I called time. You, you failed this test. You failed this course. I'll be seeing you again. And that boy looked at him. He said, sir, you don't know who I am, do you? Oh, boy, that really set the professor off. Son, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. He said, you don't even know my name, do you, sir? He said, I could care less what your name is. The boy walked up the front and put his paper right in the middle of that big stack of papers and walked out of there, passed that <laughs> test. <laughs> passed calculus, got his degree all because nobody knew who he was. So sometimes, sometimes it's to your advantage not to be known. Guys, can you start that PowerPoint for me? If you do want to know a little bit about who I am, we've got a pres presence on the World Wide Web and a one and a two and a one, two, three. There it is. Oh, there it is. Our main website is Dr. Oh, thank you very much. Now I've got two. I'll take one home with me. Our main website is drlarrymartin.org that tells you about our ministry and where we've been, where we're going. We published about 50 books on revival. By the way, Pastor, you said the words this morning in the office, and I didn't say anything, but you said the words that I love to hear more than anything else, I guess. I love to hear you said we're praying for revival. I love the sound of those words, we're praying for revival. You know, if you want revival, you can have it. He said he would pour water on the thirsty and floods on the dry ground. Leonard Ravenhill says the only reason we don't have revival is we don't want it bad enough. If you want it, you can have it. I believe it's here. I heard the prophecy this morning. I believe revival's in the house. Well, praise the Lord. Anyway, we publish about 50 books on revival. You can see those on our website. We've got another website on the Azusa Street Revival. I'm going to be teaching about that this week at the Holy Spirit Conference. And uh, we've got a website telling people how to find Jesus. Jesus is the answer. But I want to tell you about the, the website Pentecostal Gold. This is kind of my baby. Uh, we have a website of classic Pentecostal preaching. How many of you like good Pentecostal preaching? Well, you're in the wrong house if you don't. <laughs> anyway, we have over a thousand sermons by classic Pentecostal preachers, over 150 different preachers. A.A. A. Allen and Jack Cole and Jimmy Swaggart and David Wilkerson and Steve Hill. 150-something preachers. We just got permission. Haven't even got the sermons up yet. We'll be having sermons up by Amy Simple McPherson and uh, Tommy Osborne and just great resource of Pentecostal preaching. It's all free. Over 1,000 sermons you can listen to anytime you want to just on your mobile device or your computer. Listen to great Pentecostal preaching. You can listen to a sermon every day the rest of your life because by the time you listen to this 1,000, I'll have some more up there. And I pray that those can be a blessing to you. That's a, we feel like kind of our gift to the body of Christ. And the remote is on. Ah, it's working. There we go. This is our ministry in Ethiopia. Every year we have a great harvest revival in Ethiopia. We're going back next month. In about, in about three weeks, in fact, we'll be in, in Ethiopia. And uh, this is uh, our crusade at a place called Meta Kenya a few years back. And you see this guy on the front row up there, or right on the front, he's holding this little book. Same book I've got right here. This is the book we give people when they receive the Lord. It tells you to be baptized and to go to church and all the things you know that new converts need to know. And we give one of these to all the new converts. And in that meeting in, in uh, Meta Kenya, we ran out of these books. We print lots of them, but we ran out of these books on Saturday 
the biggest day of the, of the crusade is on Sunday. But we read out, run out of these books either Friday night or Saturday, I don't remember. When we ran out, we'd given away over 40,000. Over 40,000 people had come to Christ already in that five-day meeting. We see thousands saved every year. We're going back, as I said, in February. We see miracles, blind eyes open, things that we hope to see in the U.S. and seldom see, but we see all the time over there. And uh, if you'd like to go with us sometime, we're taking a team. We always take a team with us. And we've got some folks going from California and from Texas and from Texas and from <laughs> Texas and Nobody from Alaska, but anyway, you're welcome to go with us sometime to the meetings in Ethiopia. Uh, we've also got books on revival. I said we published about 50 books. I only brought three with me. Let me talk about those very, very quickly. This is the book about the revival that started the Pentecostal charismatic movement. 115 years ago, more or less, 120 years ago, there were no Pentecostal people on the earth as we know them today. Today, there's 650 million Pentecostal charismatic people. It all started in a revival in Topeka, Kansas in 1901, and that's the story of that revival. Uh, this is a book I wrote on the Azusa Street Revival. Happened in Los Angeles, California in 1906. From Los Angeles, the Pentecostal movement spread literally around the world. A one-eyed African-American man with little education, raised in poverty and obscurity, led a revival that changed the whole world. William Seymour is his name. This is that book. This is the last book I wrote. It's called Have We Lost Our Mind? It is about the, the crazy contradictions in costless Christianity. We've got people today that try to sell you a bill of goods. They tell you you can be a Christian and it won't cost you anything. That's a lie. I said that's a lie. You can be a church member and it not cost you anything, but if you're a Christian, it'll cost you everything. Jesus said let this same mind be in you. That was in him. All right. These on the table, they're $10 each, or you can get all three of them for $25. Pastor Milt, let me give these to you this morning. Maybe you'll enjoy looking at those. Turn with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 17. Revelation, chapter 1 and verse 17. I do count it a great privilege to be here. This is my second trip to Alaska. I was here last year. So glad to be back. Last year was a bucket list year for me. I turned 65 years old in August. In August, I'd been preaching for 50 years. And in August, I was in my 50th state. I've been in all 50 states. So it was a great month, August of 2017. Revelation 1.17. No, I'm not going to preach on prophecy this morning. I'm going to preach on New Year. No fear. Everybody say that. New Year. New year. No fear. No fear. Ooh, say that again. New year. No fear. Ooh, I like that. Say that again. New year. No fear. Okay, I'm done. Let's go to lunch. No, no, no. Let's don't. Let's read Revelation 1.17. I thought I had it on a slide, but I guess I best look in my own Bible here. It says, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, fear not. Who? Say that. Fear not, for I am the first and the last. Let's pray. Father, what a great privilege it is to be in Wasilla today. What a great privilege it is to be in this church where I feel your presence. Lord, I thank you for the worship team today that led us into the very presence of the Lord. Lord, I ask you that you would anoint us today with power from on high. We realize how little we can do without you, Lord. We need you today. We ask you, Lord, to help us, anoint us, use us. In your name we pray, amen. Well, it's a brand new year. It's hard to believe. Those of you with some white in your hair, as Jimmy Swaggart used to say, your hair is white with the frost of many winters. 
You know, as I know, that the years seem to go by much, much faster than they used to, but it's already 2018, and 2018 is a year of great promise. I believe it can be a great year. I believe 2018 can be our best year ever, but I also know that 2018 is a year with much perplexity. It's a year with many, many problems. There is the threat of war. Well, if you don't believe that, listen to what our brother was saying when he received the offerings this morning. That little push in a button over there in Hawaii could have triggered something. I'm telling you, it's a, it, we're sitting on a powder keg. It's not just North Korea. It's not just Iran. It's the whole world. It seems like it's sitting on a powder keg. At any moment, the wrong person could push the wrong button and we could be thrown into a nuclear war that is a frightening thought. I said, that is a frightening thought. But even more alarming than the thought of that war is the cultural war that we're facing in the West. The things that are going on in our nation. Who would have believed? Who would have believed if I stood in this pulpit 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, if I had stood in this pulpit just five years ago and told you that same-sex marriage would be the law of the land in America, you would say, no, no, not in, not in America, not in my America. But we're there today. We're there today. We abort millions of babies. We, we marry gay couples. Our, our television, our social media is so filled with corruption and sin and immorality. It's, it's amazing what's going on and violence in our cities, in our streets, in our schools. Who could have thought that a gunman would go into a small Baptist church in Texas and kill dozens of people just just almost purely for the fun of it. Or somebody would sit in a hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada and shoot down on a crowd and kill innocent people down on the street just to watch them die. Man, oh man. On top of all of that, we're a nation rapidly turning away from God. Did you know that, that almost 10% less people believe in God today than believed in God just three years ago? I'm talking about in America, less than 10%. In three years, we've seen that decline as a new generation raises up and scratches their head and wonders as if there is a God and sees a church that don't give them many answers. These are perplexing times. You say, Pastor, why are you telling us all of those things? Are you trying to scare us? No, I'm trying to tell you that regardless of what's going on around us, if you're a member of the body of Christ, you have no reason to fear. I said, you have no reason to fear. Let's say it again. New year. New year. No, fear. no fear. You say, well, why shouldn't I be afraid? If, if the world's going to blow up, if, if, the, if the society's going to hell in a handbasket, why shouldn't I be afraid? Let me tell you, there are 62 reasons. No, don't look at your watch. I'm not going to give you all 62 points this morning. There are 62 reasons why you need not be afraid because 62 times in the Bible, God said, fear not. Fear not. Or as the redneck said, ain't scared. <laughs> New year. No fear. No fear. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, it says, And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram. In Genesis 26, 24, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not. In Deuteronomy 12, 1, Behold, the Lord thy God has set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers has said unto thee. Y'all are slow, but you're catching on. Joshua chapter 8 and verse 1, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not. Ruth 3, 11, And now, my daughter, Fear not. 2 Kings 6, 16, And he answered, Fear not. 2 Chronicles 20, 17, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Isaiah 35, 4, say unto them that are fearful of heart, be strong and fear not. Daniel 10, 9, and he said, O man, greatly beloved. Fear not. Luke eleven thirteen, 13, but the angel said unto him. Fear not. Luke 1, 30, and the angel said unto her. Fear not. 
Luke chapter 12, verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. John 12, 15, fear not, fathers of Zion, daughters of Zion. Acts 27, 24, saying, fear not, Paul. Over and over and over again, 62 times in the Bible, God said for you to fear not. No matter what's coming on the world, no matter what's coming on your family, no matter what the doctor said, no matter what the lawyer said, no matter what the Congress said, no matter what the Senate said, my word for you today is fear not. New year, no fear. Well, what are we going to be afraid of anyway? Seriously, what are you going to be afraid of anyway? You're going to be afraid of the boogeyman? People say to their kids, you better be good. The boogeyman's going to get you. Well, isn't that something great to plant in the minds of your children? Let me tell you something. Listen to me carefully. If you are a child of God, washed in the blood of Jesus and full of the Holy Ghost, the boogeyman ain't going to get you. I said the devil is not going to get you. He can't even touch you unless God allows it. Now, don't betray yourself. The devil is a worthy foe. He is a capable foe. You shouldn't fool around with him. I said, don't mess around with him. He's a capable foe. But the only reason you ought to fear the devil is if you're playing in his toy box. I said, if you're sticking your toes over in the devil's territory, you might ought to be afraid. But as long as you're living for God, holy and sanctified and living right, he cannot touch you. The Assemblies of God was having this convention. Well, I'm really making this up. But the Assemblies of God was having this convention and all the district leaders were there, the district superintendents. Pastor Beal was there and my superintendent, Tim Barker, was there and my former superintendent, Tommy Moore, was there. They were all staying in the same hotel and they were coming down for breakfast. They come down the elevator and there's this big guy. Well, they're all one at a time. They're coming in. Tommy Moore comes down and there's this big guy. I mean, I mean he's... He's taller than pastor, and that's pretty tall. He's a, he's a man I can look up to. But they're coming down the elevator, and this big guy, I mean, he is big and mean and ugly. I mean, muscled. And, and he's, when they, Tommy Moore stepped off the elevator, he said, my name's Bubba Jones. And he said, I'm the meanest man in this town. And I can whip anybody in this town. And I believe I can whip you. And Brother Moore's kind of shaking in his boots, and he said, Bubba Jones said, what do you think? He looked at him, how tall and big he was. He said, well, I, I think he could. And so he said, all right, I'm going to put your name on my list. These are all the people I can whip. Tommy Moore. Tim Barker comes down the elevator. Same thing. Here's old Bubba Jones. And she stands up in front of him and says, my name's Bubba Jones, and I'm the meanest man in this county, and I can whip everybody here, and I believe I can whip you, Tim Barker. What do you think? And Tim just shaking in his boots. And he said, oh, I, I believe you could. He said, all right, I'm putting your name on my list. Pastor Bill comes down. There's Bubba Jones again. Pastor Bill looks at him. He says, you know what? He said, I think I can whip you. He said, I'm Bubba Jones, and I can whip every man in this town, in this whole county. I can whip every man in this state, and I believe I can whip you. What do you think? Brother Bill gulped real hard and swallowed and said, well, I believe you probably could. So he put his name on his list. They all went in there sitting at the breakfast table, and Pastor Bill said, you know, I didn't like that Bubba Jones. He's kind of a smart aleck, wasn't he? They all said, yeah, he was. He said, you know what? He said, I don't know if I could whip that guy, but I don't have to take that off of anybody. He said, it, he might whip me all over this hotel, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go see. I'm going to go tell him. And he walked back out there. And he looked him in the eye and he said, Bubba Jones, I think I can whip you. Bubba Jones looked down at him and said, okay, I'll take your name off my list. <laughs> That's what the devil's like. 
I said, that's what the devil's like. He's got some of you shaking in your boots. You're so afraid he's going to whip you all over the place. Take your name off the devil's list. New year, no fear. New year, no fear. 1 John 4, 4, many of you can quote it. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is within you than he that is in the world. Thank God I don't have to fear the devil. What are you going to fear? You're going to fear man? A lot of people walk in such fear of men. They fear men so much that they can't get anything done in life. I got up one morning, I was pastoring. I saw a pastor's card, how much fun it is. I can't remember the quote, being a pastor. I got up and got one of these emails, somebody chewing me up. And you know, it's a great thing about being a pastor is you can be a hero one day and a zero the next. <laughs> and I could feel depression coming on me, you know. I could feel the blues coming in. Heavy fog setting in in my office and the Mormon Tabernacle Choir lining up, getting ready to sing. Can't you hear that lonesome whippoorwill? It sounds too blue to fly. Man, it was a bad day. And then I got another email. Same day I got another email, and this is part of what it said. I just want to read part of it to you. It says, there are people who can walk away from you and hear me when I tell you this. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. I don't want you to try to talk another person into staying with you, loving you, calling you, caring about you, coming to see you, staying attached to you. I mean, hang up the phone. When people can walk away from you, let them walk. Your destiny is never tied up to anybody that left you. The Bible says that they came out from us that it might be made manifest that they were not for us. For had they been of us, no doubt they would have continued with us. 1 John 2, 19. He said people leave you because they're not joined to you. And if they are not joined to you, you can't make them stay with you. Let them go. It doesn't mean that they're a bad person. It just means that their part in the story of your life is over and you've got to know when the story's over. Stop trying to raise the dead. You've got to know when it's over. Let me tell you something. He says, I've got the gift of goodbye. It's the tenth spiritual gift. I believe in goodbye. It's not that I'm hateful. It's that I'm faithful. And I know whatever God means to me, he'll give it to me. And if it takes too much sweat, I don't need it. Stop begging people to stay. Just let them go. If you're holding on to something that doesn't belong to you and was never intended for you, then let it go. If you're holding on to past hurts and pains let them go if someone can't treat you right and love you back let them go if someone's angered you let it go if you're holding on to some thought of evil or revenge let it go if you're in a wrong relationship or an addiction let it go if you're holding on to a job that no longer meets your needs let it go if you've got a bad attitude Yeah, if you keep judging others to make yourself feel better, let it go. If you're stuck in the past, let it go. Let it go. If you're struggling with the healing of a broken relationship, let it go. If you keep trying to help someone who won't help themselves, let it go. If you're feeling depressed and stressed, let it go. If there's a particular situation that you're so used to handling yourself and God says, let me handle it now, just let it go. Let the past be the past. Forget the former things. God is going to do a new thing in 2018. Just let the past go. Stop letting other people ruin your life. That's pretty good preaching this morning. What's the third thing we're afraid of? Failure. Failure. So many people are paralyzed by the fear of failure. You know, there's something worse than failure. And that's never trying in the first place. Some people are so afraid to step out by faith, so full of fear, they never try. There's a word, I'll try to say it. 
Cacorphatheophobia. Say that with me. <laughs> yeah, that was easy for you to say. Cacorphatheophobia is the fear of failure. The fear of failure. So many people can't take a step forward in life because they're afraid they're going to fail. I got married a year and a half ago. I'm still on my honeymoon. At our age, we're going to be on our honeymoon the rest of our lives. I was married for 33 years. My wife passed away from brain cancer. My new wife, her spouse, they were married for 42 years. He died of a sudden heart attack. Were we a little afraid to step back into a relationship? Were we a little cautious? Did we say, well, I don't know. I mean, especially her. I wish she was here. She'd tell you, I ain't ever getting married again. That was her word. 42 years, I've been married all my life. I ain't ever getting married again. Maybe you're afraid to step into a relationship because you've been hurt in the past. You're afraid you're going to fail again. Do you know what? Even though both of us had some caution and fear, we didn't let fear stop us. We stepped into the greatest season of our life when we married each other because God had a plan. Don't let the fear of failure stop you. When I was 30 years old, I went back to college. I went to school one semester and quit. I went back to college when I was 30 years old. Was I a little afraid? All these 18-year-olds and I'm 30 years old going back to college? Yeah, I was a little bit intimidated by it all. But you know what? I didn't let that little bit of intimidation stop me from going back and finishing my education. What are you letting stop you? Is it fear? Somebody wrote Dear Abby one time. Remember Dear Abby? Somebody wrote Dear Abby and said, Dear Abby, I want to go back to college, but I can only go part-time, and I'll be 40 years old before I finish my degree. What should I do? Abby wrote back and said, How, will you, how old will you be in 10 years if you don't get a degree? <laughs> Still going to be 40. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I went back full-time on the evangelistic field nine years ago. I've spent... A lot of my life is an evangelist, but I went back full-time on the evangelistic field. This is not a great season in the Assemblies of God for evangelists in the Pentecostal movement. Man, if you're a prophet or an apostle, you can get headlines, but evangelists, I don't know. We're kind of the, we're kind of the yesterday of the Assemblies of God. I'm, I think I'm going to send out a card to some of my pastor friends and put Larry Soros on there. Some people think we're dinosaurs. <laughs> Was I a little threatened by the thought of going back on the evangelistic field full-time? Almost 60 years old and the season that we're in, sure. But you know what? I didn't let that stop me from doing the will of God. And God's opened some of the greatest doors I've ever seen in my life. I said, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid you're going to fail. Just step out and do it. If you're a child of God, everything you do in life, God is your partner. And he's not a silent partner. And God never fails. I said, God never fails. I'm not talking, listen, get, get, get real this morning. I'm not talking about being stupid. I'm not talking about jumping out and doing something ridiculous. But I'm talking about after prayer and after counsel, don't be afraid. New year, no fear. Go for it. <laughs> Launch out. I've got to hurry. Out of time. Fourth thing I want to tell you, some people are afraid of the future. Ooh, the future. Ooh. You know, it's not the future that scares us. It's what's out there. It's what we can't see. It's like the little five-year-old boy. His mama says to him, son, go out there on the back porch and get a can of green beans for me. And he said, mama, it's dark out there. She said, hey, no, it's all right, don't worry about it. You know, we're not afraid of the dark. We're afraid of what might be in it. Especially in Alaska. <laughs> mama, mama, it's dark out there. No, son, it's okay. Don't be afraid. There's nothing out there. Go out there and get the green beans and bring them back. He's, mama, I'm, I'm scared. She said, son, don't be afraid. Jesus is out there. He went to the back door and he said, Jesus, if you're out there, would you hand me a can of green beans? <laughs> Isn't that 
Isn't that how we want to face the future? Lord, if you can just hand it to me, if you can just show me what it's going to be. No, no, I'm telling you, you've got to face it unafraid. Regardless of what is out there, God is there. God is in control. It was the great Corey Ten Boom that wrote and said, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. Never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You may have never been there before, but God has gone before you. I said God has it in control. Your future is in his hand. Does it matter what's before us as long as we know the Lord is on our side? Does it matter what we're facing as long as we know our hand is in his hand? New year, no fear, no fear of the future. February the 6th, 2002, I woke up in the middle of the night and words come out of my mouth just like I was prophesying and I said, my times and my seasons are in your hands. My t- I never had experience like that before or since. My times and my seasons are in your hands. I got up and wrote it down, put it on the computer and stuck it on the wall in my office. My times and my seasons are in your hands. Listen to me this morning. Your times and your seasons are in God's hands. God knows what's out there. God knows what you're facing. God knows what's in your future. Just be prepared. No fear. Somebody said, well, What if I die this year? Well, what if you do? Someday you're going to. I preached for a man three weeks ago in Florida. He died last Saturday. He didn't expect to die when I was there preaching for him and having dinner with him and we were laughing and talking. He didn't expect to go into eternity. But listen, what's there to be afraid of? If you're a child of God, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. The future is out there and Christ is in it. Hallelujah. I got to quit. There was a map drawn of the new world. 1525. It's a long time ago. The man that drew it had never been there. In fact, no one had ever explored the complete Atlantic coast. So the map that was drawn in 1525, as this cartographer drew the map, he, he wrote on the map on the Atlantic coast, here be giants. And then he wrote, here be fiery scorpions. And then he wrote, here be dragons. Well, there were no dragons. There were no giants. There were no fiery serpents. He was afraid of what he didn't know. It wasn't what he knew that scared him. It was what he didn't know. It was the unknown. Here be giants. Here be fiery scorpions. Here be serpents. Years later, a British explorer, wonderful man, Sir John Franklin, 1800s, came across the same map. It's in the British Museum in London today. Came across the same map, and all along the Atlantic coast, he wrote, Here be God. Here be God. Here be God. Over the scorpions and the serpents and the giants, he wrote, Here be God. And I don't know what you may face in your future. I don't know what giants or fiery scorpions or serpents may be out there, but I want you to write across the map of your life this morning and say, here be God. Whatever you face, he is in control. New year? New year? year. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. It's a privilege, Lord, to be here, and I thank you for allowing me this opportunity. Lord, I thank you for giving me the word today for these people, and I know there's someone in this house. I know the Holy Spirit has directed this service. I know you brought us here. I I wouldn't have preached this this morning if I hadn't felt this is exactly what you wanted said in this church. Lord, I know somebody's here. They needed the word today. More than one, they've got fear in their life. Someone's been paralyzed by it. I pray in the name of Jesus that you'd cast off all fear. Set people free from it today. Fear of failure. Fear of man. Fear of the future. Fear of the devil. Let it be gone. In Jesus' name. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed for a minute. I'm an evangelist. I want to tell you about Jesus for just a minute. The greatest thing that ever happened in my life was when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. 
And if you're here in this room today and you don't know Jesus Christ, if you're here and you're not walking in fellowship with Him, maybe at one time in your life you were a Christian and you walked with God, but you're not walking with Him today. Or maybe you've never walked with God. The greatest decision you'll ever make in your life is the decision to come to Jesus or to come back to Him. You'll never regret it. I've never met one person that ever regretted following God or following Jesus. I didn't preach on salvation today, but if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're here and there's sin in your life and you're in bondage to sin, you'd like to be set free, you'd like to know Jesus Christ today, you'd like to be prayed for, I'd like for you to lift your hand, I want to pray for you to know Jesus. If you don't know him today, if you don't know Jesus, lift your hand up, I'm going to pray for you. Across the room. Across the room. Okay, I want to ask you, if you're here today, you know the Lord, but you've got fear in your life. I'm not going to spell it out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you say, you know, I had this relationship and I'm afraid. If you've got fear in your life, this message was for you. Raise your hand. I see that one hand. Oh, I see many, many, many hands. My mind knew this was a word from the Lord. You can put your hands down. Father, I thank you today for sowing the good seed of the word of God into these people's hearts. Lord, they've recognized they have fears and you're going to set them free. Break every chain. Break every chain. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me all across the building? There were many of you that lifted your hand this morning to acknowledge that there's fear in your life. As you're facing this new year, there's fear in your life. I don't... I don't know who it is that might be just totally paralyzed by it. There may be a little fear. But if you're dealing with fear, come to this altar right now. Just come. Stand right up here. We're going to pray for you. Wonderful prayer team in this church. They're going to pray for you. We're going to pray. Come. Come. you got fear. You're dealing with fear. Don't be embarrassed. I mean, don't be embarrassed. Look at all the people that are here. Don't be afraid to come. Don't come just because somebody else is. But if you're dealing with fear, come on. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lift both of your hands if you can. Say out loud, Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God today. I thank you that you spoke to me. That you said to me, Fear not. Whatever I'm facing, whatever I'm dealing with, I'm going to leave it at this altar. I'm not going to take it home with me. From this moment forward, I will not fear. I will not fear the devil. I will not fear my fellow man. I will not fear failure. I will not fear the future. But I will stand strong and courageous in the name of the Lord. I declare this in Jesus' name. I speak it over you now. I set you free. Now rejoice. Come on, now rejoice. Now rejoice. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, glory to God. Woo, glory to God. Glory, come on, church. God has done a work here today. Some people have been set free. Glory to God. Jesus, Jesus. I know pastor said, if you have a prayer team, there may be some that need special prayer. I want you to come on and move to the front. Begin to make your way through these that are here. Begin to pray. If there's those that have special, special needs, begin to pray with them. Pastor, God bless you. Thank you this morning.